Can you hear me now? I can also speak louder too, but hopefully the system is working. In fact, ironically, I'm supposed to be double mic'd up, but apparently I was zero mic'd up. Um, so this gathering is an experiment. We at Cauda Law have been continuing conversation around what we're now calling law school innovation, what we've called in the past Law 2.0, what Paul Lippi calls legal by design, what others, including us, have sometimes called the new normal. The starting place is something is changing in what lawyers do and what develops highly qualified legal professionals. And for those who don't think anything is changing, they're not here. <laughs> um, I remember the first dean's meeting I went to that Bill Henderson will be joining us here, and there he is, uh, Richard Suskin spoke at. Um, one of the highlights was Suskin said, how many of the deans are on Twitter? Uh, Dan Rodriguez wasn't at the meeting. Um, so uh, there, were, there were two of us who raised their hand. Um, and Richard Suskin said, you know, people laughed at me in the 1990s when I said lawyers would be giving advice by email. Um, lawyers, historically, are not associated with innovation. They're not associated with change or even adaptation. They're associated with tradition. Um, the Langdellian method of how law schools teach people is uh, almost sacred and sacrosanct. And yet, the reality of what most lawyers is their world is not of a zero-sum de de debate that results in an appellate court opinion. And so I was talking with Amy Griffin, who will be here today, one of our legal writing professors, about you know, the challenge for our first year legal writing program where the appellate brief and appellate advocacy remains a formative experience, but yet that's not true to what most lawyers do in terms of adding value to their clients. So we have this existential challenge of what does the new model look like? Now, first a word about me and Silicon Flatirons, and then I'll get to the challenge. I have viewed, in a sense, my career as an experiment. I quite literally took this job at Colorado Law in January, 1990, January 1999, saying, well, I'll try it for two and a half years, see how it goes, and then figure out what to do. I'm kind of still trying it and figuring out what to do. And for people who live their life that way, uh, there's a certain fear that comes in it because you're not sure, but there's a certain sense of liberation of possibility too. And part of it is, is you continue to examine what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because the goal is not to get into one groove and just stay there but to continue to reflect on what can I do different or what can I do better. So that's how I approached the job as a professor. One of the first students I had here was Brad Bernthal. And uh, not long after this, part of the experiment was to establish a center on law, technology, and entrepreneurship. And in what can be called a unfortunate um, going with the crowd, we called it Silicon Flatirons. I say unfortunate because there are all these Silicon Alleys, Silicon Swamp in New Orleans, et cetera. And what that doesn't do justice to is the fact that every single community has its own identity and its own rhythm, and none of them will be Silicon Valley. Obviously, that's the inspiration for a lot of entrepreneurship innovation, but every community has to figure out for itself what it has going for it. So I start this center focused first on telecommunications policy, which has been the area I've been most in, and we were so blessed to have Dale Hatfield as sort of a guide in True North. We then expand to intellectual property and privacy and cybersecurity, and are fortunate to bring Paul Loam onto the team. And then we bring Brad back to get our entrepreneurship efforts going. And all of these have complemented each other in really impactful ways and found enormous support from the community. Um, most notably, Jason Mendelson is here as an adjunct professor and who's been incredibly valuable with the law school and with the Silicon Flatter and Center. And so this is developing, and this has been the world that I've been uh, spending my time with because it's about innovation. It's about entrepreneurship. And I hadn't honestly been thinking a lot about the future of the legal services profession or law schools. And then just as that world is about to um, have the proverbial um, hitting of the fan, uh, and I go to Washington to work in the government, back to the antitrust division where I'd been before I became a professor, and spend a lot of time there on innovation policy. And, David Getches, uh, who is my predecessor, approached me and said, well, I'm leaving as dean. Would you consider being my successor? Uh, and after some thought and reflection, I got to the point, well, that's an experiment I'm willing to try. 
Um, and so that gets back to the proverbial challenge, which is I come back here and I'm like, wow, this world is really changing. And what does that mean for our students? And what does that mean for our community? And we are fortunate here at Silicon Flatirons to be well situated to answer that question because there's a lot of experimentation going around us. There's a lot of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial initiative. Even here in this courtroom, we host a monthly new technology meetup. And the legal world is changing. Um, we're fortunate the Kauffman Foundation, who's been willing to partner with us in the past, wanted to help as part of this initiative. And so after we planned this conference on law school innovation, um, the good folks uh, from the ABA said, well, we're not doing our associate dean's conference this year. Uh, can, can you help out? And so Kelly Tuskin and I said, sure, we're already all getting the gang together for this conference. Let's stay a little bit longer to, to get the associate deans involved. Um, and the energy from today and the ideas from today will quite literally carry over to gauge associate deans in this conversation. And part of what we're building today is a way to think about the changes that are happening and what we need to do. And part of what we're building is a network, because the world today is a world of networks, not of hierarchies, of people who are part of, to use the Paul Lippi phrase, the mishpacha, which Yiddish loosely translates means family. So you guys are all part of the mishpacha here. We really want your engagement, your ideas, because we have a lot to learn from one another. And I think we will only regret the things that we don't try, um, as opposed to trying too many new things, because when the world is changing, the answer is not to stand still. And the news for lawyers is the world is changing for everybody else. It's changing for us, too. And lawyers long wanted not to be that person. But my experience has been it's great to be that person. And so what I and students here have been experimenting with is what does it mean to be, and pick your phrase here, a legal entrepreneur or a lawyer by design and or a new normal lawyer. And we're not sure what the ultimate phrase will be, but we do know that it will be something different than the traditional work and career path of lawyers. And ultimately, my prediction is, for those who can embrace it, both law schools and lawyers, that's going to be a gift. They will have more interesting lives, more fulfilling careers. In some sense, it's going to be harder on them because more is on them. And so I don't know when Thomas Friedman's new book is coming out, but by his op-eds, you can tell this is where he's going. And ultimately, that's a liberating opportunity for us how to explain that to our students to our alums and employers, and most challengingly to our faculties, is going to be a big part of this. What Bill Henderson reminds us in the Blueprint for Change is we probably need about 20% of our faculties to get there. The good news for us at Colorado Law is we're there and then some. Um, that said, we want to be ambitious. We don't want to limit this to a minority of the faculties because ultimately the goal is to be as inclusive and engaging because no matter where people come from, students and faculty, staff, community members, there's a lot everyone has to offer. Figuring out how to incorporate that is today's challenge. To set the table for that, I had to ask myself and Brad Bernthal, who would be the right person to spark our imagination for what this means to, and pick your word here, recreate, reinvigorate, innovate, reinvent, to use Dan Katz's phrase, law school. And he said, well, there is this design school that was founded at Stanford. And it was founded kind of out of um, whole cloth. And it was the imagination of uh, a few people, one of whom is here with us today. Um, now, we're lucky because uh, we have one of the Campbells with us, um, which is John, who lives here. And so we get to borrow George from time to time. Um, Brad Bernthal and I have taught a first year course with a local venture capitalist, Brad Feld, called The Philosophy of Entrepreneurship. And we've had uh, a simulation of design-centered thinking, which, depending on how you want to call it, and Deb Cantrell will pick this up in her panel later, uh, you could call it client-centered lawyering, or you could call it how to develop empathy. But the point for lawyers is how to see the world through someone else's eyes and experience and seek to be a creative problem solver. Um, again, not necessarily what first-year law school has been historically designed to do, so much of this class that Brad and I teach is subversive. We're subverting the rest of the first-year curriculum to help people think with a different part of their brains. Um, and we tell them right up front, this class is an experiment, this class is subversive, and by the way, it is pass-fail, so don't stress too much about the grades. The point is to engage in the ideas. And for those who haven't heard of Design Center thing in the DD school, you're in for a treat. And for all of us, it's really a chance to open up our minds about this basic project. Um, and let me let you take it away. Thanks, Phil. No, thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Great. Um, Phil, that was, uh, thank you for the introduction. When um, we talked on the phone, I was in Berlin working with our um, Stanford campus in Berlin and another D school we've helped start out there. And I was getting out of the subway for the short, short conversation. And just a short conversation, um, I knew immediately this was a place I wanted to show up and be a part of the conversation, just the way you thought. So the, I didn't realize you approached your life as an experiment, um, which I do too. Um, and I never thought I would be at a university. At, um, and I've been now at Stanford for over 10 years, I think 11 years. Um, it's good to um, see people in the audience I know. Um, Jason was mentioned already uh, back from the Valley days. And people see people in the audience who think they know me because they know my brother. But I, I'm an, for those of you who don't know, I'm an identical twin, and he lives here, and I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, we already had a quick conversation, Peter and I, uh, earlier. He thought I was John. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think um, what we talked about is I will talk for about uh, 15, 20 minutes, but then we're going to shift to more of a fireside chat discussion. But the goal is to engage more of a dialogue because I think you're starting a really, on a really interesting conversation. Um, and the question I would reflect back to is the one I heard is, how do you design the future of law school or the future of the legal profession? I mean, do we know what the future of law school is? Anyone? No. I thought someone might <laughs> raise their hand. I'd be like, phew. No. OK. Um, I, I think that is right at the heart of the problem, is we're all products of the industrial era, whether we know it or not. In the industrial era, I think how we've been groomed is to solve problems that we know the answer to. And the question is, how do we lead ourselves forward in a direction when we don't know the outcome? I don't think we know really how to do that. But we're in an environment where the context is shifting, and we realize that change is coming, but we don't know what to do about it. And so then we approach it either with like disengagement or a sense of urgency or crisis, or we just try to go faster, and that just worsens the problem. So I think we're at a place where we don't know how to lead our way towards unknown outcomes. There was a quote, I think it was Joy Ito, who runs the Media Lab now, that really stood out to me. He said, the cost of planning now exceeds the cost of experimentation. That has massive implications. It used to be hard to make something and try something, whether it was a company or a new product or a service or, or something like that. And so we would spend our time planning our efforts and coming up, with, coming up with how we knew we could make it work, and then we would spend the time making it work. Now, that worked, I think, in a world that's not that complex, so that doesn't change very fast. But in an environment that is increasingly complex and increasingly changing, what happens when you get your plan done? Right. It's either wrong or it's irrelevant. That, that doesn't seem to work anymore. But the ability to run a quick experiment now is a lot less expensive. And so this, the question is, do we plan our way forward or do we experiment our way forward? I think it's at the heart of what I want to get to today. What we found is the D School was originally started to, to take the way designers historically solve problems in a more human-centered experimental way. And we recognize that that could be a way to nurture and unleash the innovation potential of all disciplines. That we think that creativity is not just something related to the arts, but everything's a creative act. Designing a new legal framework, or a new business model, or a new hospital experience, or the airport surgery experience, or K-12 education, all of those are creative acts. But we don't nurture the creative potential of all students. So they go out heavy in their analytical thinking and almost completely under anemic in their ability to solve creative problems. So the D School started to help students learn how to tackle problems that they don't know the answer to and to be confident in their ability to solve it in a creative way. And we found the best way to help people learn how to tackle problems that they don't know the answer to, like the future of what law school is, is to introduce them to a creative process and then give them a chance to practice it on as many real messy problems as possible. It's only about the practice do you start to realize and trust these new behaviors as opposed to the behaviors that you may have as a habit, as a product of your education. So I thought we could try it. You game? Yeah. You're not sure? <laughs> OK. All right, so I'm going to give you a, um, a challenge that we gave to one of our student teams. And it was, uh, this is Jane Chen. Um, if you've heard this specific project, I'd ask you not to answer the first question. OK, so this is Jane Chen. She's from the business school or was from the business school, she's now an alum. And everything at the D School is done in teams, because we think innovation requires diversity of perspective, not just in innovation as a collaborative act. So she's on a team um, with a computer scientist, a um, 
um, a business, um, I think a business process engineer and another maybe a designer. So it was four people and they were given this challenge. So the, all of these students, um, they were interested in having social impact. So they're working on problems that impact the developing world. We were working with a nonprofit in Nepal and the challenge they're giving is design a cheaper incubator for countries like Nepal. So the infant mortality rate in developing countries is very high. And um, the incubators that you have access to are very expensive, which means they're not easy to get for a developing country. Anyone know what an incubator costs? Grand. That's great. It's probably good, you're a good one. I think it's 20 grand, but the right order of magnitude or two, an order of magnitude off, very, very expensive. So it's really hard to get, a cheaper, uh, get an incubator in developing countries just from the cost perspective. For the countries that did get them, they usually inherited them from a, from a developed country. It might be in a language that they didn't read. So if the parts broke down, they couldn't get a new part, they might not even know how to read the instructions. So there are a lot of barriers to getting incubators. Okay, so if this is the challenge, let's just tackle that challenge. How might we design a cheaper incubator? What could we do? What would you do to reduce the cost of the incubator? Yeah. Use ambient heat sources. So something other than maybe electricity. Yeah, what else? Source it locally so you don't have to ship it all the way across the world. And you could probably use local materials, which also reduces the part cost. What else? Simplify. Simplify. Maybe they don't need that pole, right? So start taking away the things you don't need. I love it. Violate the patents and just do it. It's like we, there's a different legal approach. We, um, one of the strategies of, of innovation is copy um, or steal. Or what do you want to call it? Handling some risk as opposed to reducing it entirely, which might lead to some of these other answers like reducing part count or not having the same features. Okay, these are great. You guys are jumping to solve the problem. If we followed all of those strategies, what would we come up with? I think we'd end up with another incubator. Just Yeah, it'll look like this. It's just an incremental innovation, maybe slightly cheaper. But these folks have been working on this for 20 years, I think, or a long time and they didn't really crack the code. Maybe they made it a little less expensive. But I think, what this, I think what this reveals is more of our trap of thinking. Our tendency is to accept the problem we're given, design a cheaper incubator, and immediately jump to solve it. We're great problem solvers. Reduce the part count, you know, source things locally. All really great strategies, but what we end up with, if that is the way we solve our problems, is incremental change. If what you really want is something that is gonna change the game, you want innovation, you can't predict the outcome, so you need a different way to solve the problem. So the way we teach our students a creative approach is to disrupt those habits of mind and to, and to start a different place. So one of the places we start is to start with empathy. You use that word. Understand the human experience before you solve the problem. And so for Jane and her students, they, they've been introduced to this creative process that starts with empathy. So the first thing we do is we put them on a plane and we fly them to Nepal. And now they're spending time with the doctors and the hospitals who have this problem. So instead of trying to solve the problem in your office or in a cubicle far away, you immerse yourself in the environment. So now you can imagine they're walking around the hospitals in Nepal and one of the students is with a doctor and they walk into the, is it the infant, the maternity ward? And the student was really surprised. It was filled with incubators. I think he just assumed that they didn't have it. It was filled with incubators, but the thing he, he was also even more surprised with is the incubators were empty. So he asked the doctors, hey, why are the incubators empty? And the doctor just said in passing, that, oh, all the babies are born in country, they don't survive the trip to the hospital. And that's the type of insight you would never gain if you're not there. And the student, without telling us, the, the faculty at the time, they just bought themselves a bus ticket, they went out in country, now they're spending time with the mothers who are losing their children. And you can imagine what they're encountering now, is the, the grief and the loss of mothers who've lost one or two or three children. And they realized it didn't matter how cheap you made the incubator, it wouldn't solve the problem, because the babies weren't in the hospital. The, the challenge from that empathy was, 
how do you keep the babies warm to survive the trip? So that empathy led to an insight to reframe the problem. Half the failures in industry are not because you couldn't solve the problem creatively, it's we solved the wrong problem. As soon as they realized it's about keeping babies warm, a whole new set of new ideas popped out. So, you know, keeping things warm. I don't know, sleeping bags work. And so then you start prototyping really quick and dirty prototypes. So in addition to empathy, we introduce an attitude of very rapid experimentation. And you hear that in language from like Lean and Agile and other methodologies, but it's how quickly can you test whether or not you're on the right track. So they're hacking things together, and from lots of little experimentation, they realize that there's a phase change material that looks like butter. You're talking about alternative heat sources that you can boil. And then instead of the temperature cooling like this, it cools like this. They put it in the back of the sleeping bag, and for less than 2% the cost of a traditional incubator, they are now able to keep babies warm enough to make the trip to the hospital. And these students realize, one, the, um, the potential of their own creative capacity that maybe they didn't think of themselves as a creative individual, and they see the impact they can have in the world. We're not telling them someday you'll make an impact. They're working on a real problem right now. They've canceled all their big job offers. They started a company called Embrace. They're living in India. They're now, I think they've saved something like 50,000 lives that are in clini clini clinical trials, and they have the potential to save something like 300,000 lives in the next three years, which in a country like Nepal would raise the GDP about a billion dollars. So that's, that's, a, that's the type of approach that we use to introduce students with a creative process to tackle problems they don't know the answer to. So it's interesting to ask the question, how might this work for redesigning the future of law school? Just to, oh, here's the latest version. Like from prototyping, they realized that the mothers, just by handing a prototype to the mothers, the mothers were concerned with a disembodied head. So they had to put a window in, not because it was needed functionally, but it was needed from a human experience. So the attitude of empathy and prototyping really matters. So just to visualize how we might introduce students to a way of working that helps you move forward when you don't know the answer that leads to unexpected innovation. Start with empathy. Use that understanding of the human experience to redefine the problem. It's usually a problem that's different than what you thought it was. From that reframe problem, you can generate lots of many new ideas that you didn't have before that you want to very quickly test in rapid experimentation, you create prototypes that you can put back in people's lives and start to see whether or not you're on the right track. Now you might adapt a creative approach for your work or for your organization. It may not look like this. What's important is that there's the principle and mindset and value of empathy and this attitude of experimentation that you do in a collaborative, iterative way. And that sets up a different rhythm and a different vocabulary for collaboration. Now the thing I would maybe just in the last five 10 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 minutes of conversation, is um, to reflect, if you guys are trying to design the future of law schools, how did we design the D school? Because the D school didn't exist before. So I just want to give a little high level um, broad strokes on that. So what we did is we didn't know what the D school was when David Kelly, who's a former professor of mine, and I started it. We're, I'm an entrepreneur. He's a tenure line appointed faculty member, but never got a PhD, never wrote a paper. So he felt he scammed the system, and neither of us really knew what to do in a university. We just knew how to start companies. So that's what we did. We just started the D school. We got in trouble for using the D school name because it's not a school, we learned. School means something important at a university. Um, but once we got our own funding, then the university really thought it was a good idea. Um, but the, <laughs> we, just had, we just had an instinct. This was sort of like the instinct that Phil was talking about. We had an instinct that a new kind of leader was needed in the world, one that could could tackle problems we didn't know the answer for, that could value the human element as important as the business technology and legal and other elements, that could work in a collaborative and experimental way. And that's what was needed to sort of rise to the challenge of our time. We had that instinct. We also had the instinct that a creative approach might be this glue for those types of collaborative teams to tackle a huge range of ideas. But that's all we knew. We didn't know what then what a D school was, other than we had a groovy name. Right? So how do you design the future of innovation education? So we just took, we used design thinking, or whatever you want to call this, and used design thinking to design the D school to create an environment in which people can learn design thinking. It's very recursive. But we used design to design our education program. So we started with empathy, with the students. We didn't know, this, we didn't know what it meant to attract students from every discipline to work on collaborative teams on innovation challenges. We didn't know what it meant to attract faculty to work on diverse teams, because all the classes are taught by teams of faculty. So we started with empathy. And the students aren't required to be at the D school, and so they have to want to be there. And we actually don't care what they work on. As long as they're working on something hard, 
and get to practice a creative approach, which means we had to have empathy of what projects they were interested in having to tackle. So by engaging them in discussions and interviews and conversations and um, observing how they behave and where they go, we learned that the, the types of projects they had a heart for, this was uh, eight to 10 years ago, so to give you a sense. Um, they used, before that, they used to want to be the next Bill Gates. And they saw the world as either for-profit or non-profit. But at the time we were starting the D school, that had changed. They wanted to have social impact, and they didn't see the world as separate. They wanted to have impact in the world and commercial success along the same way. So themes like social entrepreneurship, health and wellness, redesigning K through 12 education, those were some of the early themes that we just did projects around because we started with empathy for the students. And they came. And then the second thing is we, and this was our first um, D school class in boot camp. The second thing we did is we took an attitude of experimentation in everything we did, which I think is very different in most university settings. Even what we thought of as a class, that was our prototype. And this is the first syllabus of one of those classes. So you can think about how faculty usually plan a syllabus. It probably looks like most business plans. It's in a Word document or Excel spreadsheet, designed down to the day. It doesn't change. And you maybe do a survey at the end of class, and a year later you might change it. For us, we didn't quite know. So we did a rough prototype of a class plan and started the class. And at the end of every class session, we sat down with the students. How did that work? What worked? What didn't? And they were really surprised to be able to, well, the faculty were surprised that the students would join the debrief. And then the students were surprised that they could have a voice in the direction of their own learning. And then we could evolve. Like if we realized that we, we were going to go into prototyping, but they still didn't understand Teams, we would just move the post-it note and change the class. And they were surprised that they could direct their own learning. And so we thought of everything as a prototype, the class, the learning experiences. Because there's no extra space at Stanford, even though we had a lot of money that we fundraised, we ended up, our first space was a double wide trailer. So even the whole D school was a mini prototype. And we had to move from one temporary space to another every year until we finally got the people out of the building we'd eventually be in. And at first we thought that'd be really cumbersome, but from an attitude of experimentation, it built a rhythm of reinvention. Every 12 months, we had an excuse to completely reboot the D school. If you think about rhythms in a university, usually once something gets going, it persists into irrelevance. As opposed to now, when there's something about moving from one space to another that humans expect change, we could, when they expect a change, we could drop bad habits. Like, we no longer meet that way, now we meet this way. We no longer hire that way, we now hire this way. We no longer budget that way, we budget this way. So we were able to add the attitude of experimentation of our offerings and of our whole business process to evolve the whole D school. And I'm convinced that the combination of our empathy for our students to follow what's important, when in doubt, follow the students, and have a rhythm of reinvention is what allowed us to evolve the D school going forward. So I just want to highlight in closing some of the few things that we learned along the way. One is that um, mindful of process isn't enough. We thought this magic design-centered process would, would unlock the creative potential of all students and lead to innovation, and it did. But um, bad team dynamics would blow up a team just as much as bad process. And the more diverse you have on a team, which we needed for these tackle these messy problems, the higher the dynamics. And so we had to figure out how do we build a mindfulness of team. And you've all, you know this when you're in a work setting. You'll work in a way and then something happens and it just feels wrong. Usually we just gloss over it because that's a human issue. We've got business to run. But if you don't deal with the tend to those things as you go, they accumulate, then the team blows up. So the we brought in this guy named Julian. Um, he was a PhD in psychology. We just affectionately called him the D-shrink. And we brought him in to help make it safe for the students to have that honest human conversation. And it turned out the faculty need him more than the students. But it was amazing what happened is it created an environment of um, allowed for diversity of perspective to be a constructive tension as opposed to destructive tension. It created an environment of emotional safety, which you need if you want people to put their creative selves out on the table in an environment where there's pressure of getting the projects done. And it helped us create a regular culture of feedback. So this is after one of our exec ed programs. I talked about how we feedback, did a feedback session after every class. At the end of a three-day workshop of executives, we sit down, debrief how it went, and evolve the program. And you add those things at the team layer to the process layer, and the whole culture starts to evolve. And the next thing I would say we learned is you can be mindful of process and mindful of team, and there's something else that can get in the way. Sometimes the space is in the way. I mean, what, is this, what is this room designed for? What type, is it collaborative? No. No, what is it designed for? Listening. listening. You listening, me talking. Like I have all the answers 
and you don't. And there are times, I think, that's a very important format for learning. But what we found is when it comes to um, learning to tackle problems we don't know the answer to, expertise is not what we rely on, because that's based on historical knowledge. So we need to create an environment where students can wrestle with problems. It's more project-based. Um, and it's, we're lucky, I think, and you can think about this in your own environment. If you go into a conference room, what is that designed for? Talking. Talk, 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 yeah. Does anything get done in a conference room? Not much. So like we learned right away that if we want our students to work on a project, we had to redesign not only the classroom, but what the whole collaborative context. As an entrepreneur, I used to be a CEO of startups, and I, I thought that space was either a facilities project, give it to my COO or head of facilities to make sure everyone had a space, they had the ergonomics, they weren't going to hurt themselves, finance had a locked door, and the salespeople had a quiet room to talk in. It was either a facilities project or it was about brand, show how groovy you are. But now, I think space is probably one of the most powerful levers of a leader to shape and bias organizational behavior. Because as humans, we respond to the physical place we're in. And we don't realize that we've biased people's behaviors without thinking about it. So we can reverse that and say, what behaviors do we want to amplify? The innovative behaviors. So we, we, knew, we knew that we wanted the environment to f adapt to the learning mode. If they're in empathy mode, we wanted them to sit and be more human. If they were prototyping, we wanted to get up and try stuff. And we'd put everything on wheels so it could move around. Um, we found that the students told us that if the space looks too precious, they don't feel safe to change it. So we made it unprecious, so if it's not working, they can hack it and adapt it. And there's something about being open to unfinished thoughts that you can do more easily in an unfinished space as well. We want our students, instead of sitting and talking for a long time, to get up and try something, a bias towards action, so we make seating uncomfortable. Right? So they can't sit for very long. They get up and try stuff. And last thing maybe I'll just highlight here is status differences get in the way of innovation. If there are huge status differences, either between faculty and students or leader and worker, then people don't feel safe sharing what they know or their ideas. And you don't know where the good ideas are going to come from. So how do you level status? Confer conference rooms have status built in. There's a head of the table. Whoever sits there runs the meeting. So we create rooms that don't have status. It disrupts status. I love the word subversive class. So I can change status in this room. I can relinquish status by sitting down. I can gain status. So leadership can move based on who has expertise at the time. So I'm just highlighting these things, the things we learned by taking the process of empathy and an attitude of experimentation and turning it on ourselves to experiment what the D school is involved with going forward. And now the D school has over 800 students, about the size of the business school. Those students have launched companies and projects that have impacted millions and millions of lives. The president of the university has asked us, how do we bring creative confidence to the rest of the university? We're barely keeping up. Even though we're doubling students, now come to Stanford graduate schools because of the D school. They want to go B school, D school, or law school, D school, or ed school, D school. And we're barely able to keep up to the demand, and they're not required to be there. So there's something in this way of working that is attracting our next generation of leaders. And uh, my twin brother, John, and I are asking, how do we unleash the creative potential of everyone on the planet? So if the, in, as you think about designing the future of law school, what I've learned is when you don't know the direction, you don't know what the outcome is, instead of focusing on what innovations, what ideas are going to save the day, don't focus on innovation, focus on the innovators, the source of those ideas and nurture behaviors. Instead of focusing on attached to clarity of outcome, focus on the process you use to get to unexpected outcomes. Instead of relying on expertise of what's worked in the past, rely on the insights that come from diverse teams or tackling a problem they haven't seen before. And instead of relying on your ability to predict the future, start with something small and experiment your way forward. What you're optimizing for is evolvability, not reliability or repeatability. Okay, how's that for just Perfect. a quick Great. overview? I'm super excited to engage you guys in conversation about what you guys are thinking about. So um, this is, uh, anyway, anyway, what's the right architecture? So you sit in front here? I would sit over here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. We were going to put the table between us and you without thinking about it. Yeah. We're going to sit on our name tags. So um, first, for those who haven't read the book, or for those like me who own the book and it's sitting on their to-read shelf. Can I take this off, by the way? Yes. I rarely wear one of these. Uh, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, is worth acknowledging. The idea here is that a growth mindset can be taught. Mm -hmm. The two quick mindsets, fixed mindset, which is 
I am good at this, I'm bad at that, done, game over. Or growth mindset, which is I can get better at something. And one of the challenges of what you said is focus on innovators. We at law school have a legacy challenge because the legacy brand of lawyers is the opposite of innovators. Mm -hmm. So law has been as an instrument of stasis, keep things the same, bring order, yeah. not creativity and generativity. Which so add variance and yeah. That's right. Yeah. So one of the challenges we have is how do you engage students and develop a growth mindset over the course of their three years, in many cases, taking people who might have thought about themselves, I'm not an entrepreneur, I'm not an innovator, I'm a lawyer, and turn them into, wait a minute, I can be an innovative lawyer. And I just want to be very clear about something, and Deb Crantrell will pick this up, I'm sure. When I use the word innovator or entrepreneur, anyone who thinks private sector, like, you know, like George said, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I have spent the majority of my career in academia or in government, yeah. and that doesn't stop me from thinking about myself as an innovator entrepreneur. Yeah. It's a mindset about how you think about yourself and methods, what method you use. Which, yeah. um, So let me pose this to you now, which is part of the challenge we all have is the people who are coming to us may not be as naturally, uh, as much inclination towards a growth mindset yeah. or entrepreneurial methods. So we have... Uh, we can't just take people and say, okay, your innovators go loose. We have to help them find their inner, innov inner, inner innovator. Yeah, I love that. Um, and when I think of innovator, I don't think um, entrepreneurial, un entrepreneurship, because that's a word that people over-associate with tech, young computer programmers of venture capital. And like, well, where's the role? So I got, I got more comfortable with my jacket off, but you can't hear me. Is that what it is? Is that better? Okay, um, I, I, I think if we're not careful, entrepreneurship, it gets over-associated with a young male computer programmer in technology funded by a venture capitalist, as opposed to the word innovator. African-American like, woman working in the public defender's office. Yeah, or the nurse, or the teacher. So I love the word innovator because the goal is not just to do tech startups. The goal is to unleash the creative potential of all, all people, regardless of the challenge they face. So I love that frame. The, the second thing is I think they often come to us, if you say, in a, they don't think of themselves as an innovator, often because we force them to pre-select as an identity. So it's, what's, what I love, there's two things I want to say here. So the, what I love about the D school is we'll have students who've come in and we force them to identify to a discipline. Am I an engineer or an artist? Do I like music or do I like science? And they don't get to pick both. We force them to pick one. And so they'll come in with an identity of an engineer um, and then they'll work on a project like this um, with a team and then what I love is they surprise themselves and they realize I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur but I just started a company with my teammates that is now providing alternative lighting to the developed world and so they leave feeling like an entrepreneur or they leave feeling like an innovator so in some sense it's allowing them to own maybe a deeper identity that we force them to segregate um, and so it's in there the second thing I think you find very quickly is there are some kids who come in more of a fixed mindset we realized in our work that half of what we were doing with the graduate students at Stanford is having them unlearn bad habits they picked up in elementary school, <laughs> right? So, which is to get in, you think, what does it take to get in a place like Stanford? Pass all the tests. Don't fail, don't take risks. And if you, and then we expect them to go out in the world and take risks and work with others. And in elementary school, you're supposed to work alone because if you work with others, it's called cheating. And so I think there's something, we realize that for us to really prepare the students to do our work with them, we had to start sooner. So we keep our work at we keep doing our work at Stanford. We started a whole K through 12 lab, because there's a all kids. I have three boys, nine, seven, and five. You can tell they all start school feeling creative, but rarely do they survive school. And I think we have great intention, but there's something about the way we've structured our early and higher education that strips that away. Um, and so we've we've helped with the way we nurture teachers to create learning experiences. Um, where they don't, the teachers don't know the answers, but they can help the students discover new answers. And that starts to get really exciting. So I think our work begins long before here. It'd be interesting, like how do you create, how do you educate legal thinkers starting in kindergarten? Well, and then how do you do better assessment mm -hmm. when you're looking at your applicant pool who's likely to be mm -hmm. effective legal thinkers and professionals? Um, one of our colleagues, Scott Moss, and Alexi Renee Marks, who's here, has been looking at that. Um, and I think one not surprising for many people is LSAT scores are probably <laughs> overemphasized at the expense of, you could say just about everything else, but you could just say a lot of other things, which turn out to be much more 
uh, predictive of future success. Um, so one other thing that's a challenge, based on what I just said, we'll tee it up, is what I'll call dualistic thinking. It's really important for me to get good grades, therefore all the other stuff doesn't matter. If you want to say the other stuff matters, people will often gravitate to this, oh, so grades don't really matter, it matters how well I develop my personal narrative or my network. And you're like, no, I wouldn't put it that way. Um, it's, it's a challenge that, you know, how do you tell a nuanced story about what makes someone successful? And right. it's, uh, it's something where people want to gravitate to a clear, very simple narrative. And if you have a richer framework of activity, experiences, um, it's hard to keep people's attention. So how do you create a narrative about the whole person and professional that people continue to develop into uh, in the face of a, a temptation of people, which is, OK, I just want to get good grades, and that's all I need to do, yeah. uh, as a, you know, opposed to a, a broader story? That's a really interesting question. Um, what I was listening to, the, the thing that popped to me is like, I think we assume we have to construct the narrative. And I'm not sure we have to. What, so what, I lo what I find interesting is the students are constructing the narrative for themselves if you focus on something else. And that is we, we just um, we focus on finding projects that are meaningful and real for them and then equipping them to tackle those problems so that they can discover something about themselves, about their creative potential, and see their impact in the world. And, and what's interesting is they come for many reasons. And once they start wrestling with something that's real and, and see that they can solve it and something they thought was impossible and discover they can have impact, not solve it in like a conceptual way, like I solved that problem by, through an equation or an argument, but in a real way. Like it's in the world, they met someone whose life was impacted, they discovered what the real need was, they put something in the world that changed that person's life. It's in the world learning. Um, they, they show up for it, they want more of that in, the world, in their life. Mm -hmm. So they come back for it. And then if you, if you ask, well, what do they put on their resume from the D-School experience? It's not the classes they took. It's not the narrative. It's not design thinking. It's the project they work on. I worked on like, redesigning, helping people save money who didn't. Uh, and how long is and, that arc of experience before they yeah. arrive at that narrative? Real quick, that narrative, they then tell their friends. Yeah. And their friends say, well, what's, why are you so excited? Like, you're jazzed about this. You're speaking to an intrinsic motivation for the students as opposed to an extrinsic, like here are the criteria you have to solve for to get the job. And, they, um, and that motivation is very different. It shines and other people come. So it, it varies where that comes from. It, sometimes people get it in an hour. All of our D-School experiences are experiential. Like this is a rare thing to try to talk someone into design thinking. It's like usually how we'd start a class is, you want to learn how to solve problems you don't know how to answer to, let's start. And, here's, and we just get people going with something in an hour, they can see what is it like to use an, an, an empathy and prototyping approach to solve a quick problem versus the way they do. Sometimes after that, they're like, this is what I've been looking for. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like, it confuses them, so they, they try again, and it could take a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, it's, but usually, often the most, more skeptic they are, the harder they flip to the positive. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they're on that, they don't see the world the same any, anymore. Right? They see the world as a place they can look at and find problems worth solving that they can Im involve others in leading that. But we haven't really, the narrative is different for every single person. I think that's the, hmm. the trick. OK. All right, so let me try to sum up um, that eloquent statement, which is that the challenge is to create a structure where individuals can develop and define their own narrative based on ex lived experience. Because if you are in the business of offering three narratives, you get to choose you're a transactional lawyer, litigator, or regulatory lawyer, you're setting people up to artificially try to force themselves into a box. And the more liberating experience is to say, listen, there's no box. Everyone's going to have to define themselves over their career, because it's a continuing journey. And how do you give people the confidence to come to their own definition of themselves? Um, is that an OK summary? That's great. So I'll try to speak up in case you can't hear the the mic. And don't be passive. Otto, you're, you're, you're the man. If you can't hear, George, you say, you know, say something. So one more question, then I want to get the audience involved. We're going to have a discussion later this afternoon using the word competencies. Um, Neil Hamilton, Bill Henderson, others have talked about this. If we were in a medical school, it would be, yeah, of course, we're talking about the competencies you're developing. In law schools, um, mea culpa, before I was dean, um, I never once thought about competencies that any of my students were ever developing. Just, I was teaching telecom law, and I did collaboration in there. I did group projects. But I never thought of that as a competency I was 
-hmm. trying to help people develop. So mm -hmm. as we are becoming more self-conscious about the experiences our students have and what are critical competencies, um, any thoughts from your experience in the D school? Have you reverse engineered what you've done that's worked and said, aha, OK, this is a key competency, because in order to be successful, they had to do this. Now I realize that's critical. Or, or is it constantly iterative, mm. such that you haven't actually um, been self-conscious about competencies? Mm. That's a great question. The, the, the first thing that popped to me was um, to use a different word than competency. Mm -hmm. and maybe this is semantic. When I hear the word competency, I think of a bar you have to jump over, like a certain threshold. Right. As soon as you say that, there's like metrics about do you reach it or not. And, and there's like, you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. Something about that word has that hmm. attachment to it, which I think, I think of the word more like capacity. Do you have the capacity to? And so I think that's more of a, mm -hmm. there's a spectrum. I have yeah, a, that word's I, more capacious. <laughs> yeah, it's bigger. Sorry. <laughs> that's more, so like, you can, have, you can have that capacity, but it's still um, in its infancy. Or you can, and then you can nurture and grow that capacity over time. I like that as a way of thinking about it. So there's never an end to like, I am an innovator, I'm now done, right? I found this is a lifelong practice. It's more of a practice than it is a, I've got the credentialing. So I would choose a different word. If I think about the capacities we want our students to have, um, they're not the ones that application. You talked about how do you select yes. students. Um, we had them, because they, they had to get into Stanford. And then once they got into Stanford, since we, had small classes, they had to apply to the D school. And we tried everything to try to figure out how do we discern whether they had the innate capacities at least to start with this. It, like we, we had the front, why do you want to be in this class? And well, how do you think? They, could, they all know how to BS their way through that. So that didn't help, right? So we're experimenting with um, other ways to look at that. One that worked was um, some people have talked about T-shaped people. You have, you have disciplinary depth and the capacity to integrate that with other disciplines. So we literally drew an empty T, said, tell us your experiences in where you feel you're expert. And, mm. and then tell us your experiences about working across different expertise. And immediately, you could see visually whether they were open. Like, if all of their stuff was in this thing and they had nothing up here, or if all their stuff was here and nothing here, we knew they didn't have that marriage between honoring depth of expertise and an open-mindedness to other expertise. So that's one at a high level. In terms of these more human comp capacities, I would say this. Um, Do you have that exercise, kind of the toolkit for that? Did you develop some materials around it? Yeah, literally think, take a piece of paper, draw a big T, and ask. That's it. That was an experiment. We didn't know. And it turned out that was far more enlightening for us about discerning whether they had we didn't quite know what the capacities were. It was revealing to whether they'd be successful at the D school than writing about that. But I would think of capacities like um, um, there's different modes of problem solving. Like the and we analytical thinking is only one. There's visual thinking. There's uh, physical prototyping. There's storytelling. There's sort of human centeredness, like the ability to have empathy with another person. There's integrative thinking as opposed to just and there's generative thinking. Um, and there's all these other things and there's resilience, which is about we talk about um, failure, we fail often, make failure okay. I don't think that's the well, right so framing. Well, resi so no, resilience is that one we um, here have thought a lot about because we've studied who gets jobs within a certain period of time after graduation. The number one quality that's important is resilience. So it's interesting, how do you create that? And we usually say make failure okay. I don't think that's it. Because failure feels bad. And I even think failure is the wrong word for it. Right? If you want your first prototype, it's not about did the prototype work or not. Like, did the product idea work or not? It's like, did that prototype act as a probe for you to learn more? If it helped you learn more, that was actually successful for learning. So we use the wrong word, I think, for our experimentation. So that's one. The second one is, it's not about it crashing. It's about whether you get up after it crashed. So I think we, we intentionally get students into, we call them learning traps, where they hit a wall so that we can pick them up on the other side and they can see that they can stand up on the other side. So I don't see, other than just, Vocabulary saying failure is okay. It's interesting to ask the question: How do you help students experience getting on their two feet after they've had something that didn't work that they thought would? Well, one yeah. will come up in Paul Ohm's panel about how students can stand out is students being willing to keep putting themselves out, even though they're going to often have to put themselves out a lot before they actually get a job, particularly their first job. Um, one of the highlights last summer, um, Brad Bernthal got an email he shared from a student that was his and Jason Mendelson's got a great job in another state after 100 coffees, he said. OK, so you got the Malcolm Gladwell, you know, um, 10,000 hours. This is the 100 coffee rule. 
Yeah. Don't expect to get your dream job. So you've had yeah. hundred different coffees with people you've sought to connect with, yeah. because it's a long game of getting to know people and looking for the right match. But there is something right there about when, how do we, how do we create conditions where students will put themselves out there? I, they will put themselves out there if the teachers put themselves out there. So we found when we create the learning environments, if the faculty are f afraid of failing in their teaching and they're sticking to their plan mm. because they know the right answer or they're afraid to tackle a problem that they don't know the answer to because their identity is attached to their expertise as opposed to feeling like they don't know the answer, um, we found that we can get the students to take more risks if we as a teaching team create risks. Like We will model a bad or good interview for empathy before we have them do it. If we just talk about doing an interview and have them try it, they haven't seen us be vulnerable and have a bad interview. So I think there's a link between the risk of a faculty member and the students. Okay, so one big meta point, then I want to get the audience um, a couple questions. Uh, the goal of this conference, like I said, is building this mishpacha, this network. Um, key nodes in the network are the Colorado Law people here who are kind of officially involved. So Paul Lohm, who will lead a panel. Brad Bernthal, I've mentioned. Um, Blake Reed, over here. Melissa Hart, Scott Pepit, Susan Neville Mark, and Alexi Brunet Marks. I don't know if I've missed any. Uh, Amy Bauer over here. Um, any of those nodes, if you will, if you have ideas like, hey, we need to make sure we talk about this T-shaped exercise. It's a great thing to do in orientation. Let one of them know, um, and they'll talk to either me or Laura Littman, who's trying to keep us organized. And we want to get out to people the ideas of this discussion. Um, so please, as you have ideas, reflect on them. Let us know, because the goal is to develop some uh, opportunities to experiment. Our tradition here at Silicon Flatirons is the first question goes to a student. Nice. Yep. Otto? <laughs> <laughs> what is the future of law school? <laughs> <laughs> so in the Passover Seder that some of us had there this week, there are four questions, and there's a great chance to debate which of them is the deepest. Um, and one of the uh, archetypes asked the question that that's deep. At the Passover Seder, my daughter argued that was the deepest question you can ask. Um, so the future is bright for those willing to experiment and for those who can think about where are these successful alums and how did they get there. Part of the problem is too often law schools were insulated from their alums and they weren't thinking from the perspective of what did their alums learn that mattered and how to double down on that. So, so my answer to your question in short is, the answers are out there. We've just been looking at the wrong places. Can I agree with half that? Please. <laughs> so I, the, my first thing I thought of was the same that first thing you said, and that is the future of the law school depends on the rate of experimentation. Hmm. I don't know what the answer is, but it will depend. On, it's, it will succeed or fail based on its ability to adapt, and that comes from experimentation. I actually think the future of law school may be more easily found not by looking at alum, which are the products of the current system in an old in the institution as it exists today, but um, start earlier. Look at the kids. If you want to see what the future is, start with kids who in 20 years will be the future, or in 10 years or 7 years. So I almost wonder what answers you'd get if you start pre-upstream. So maybe the answer is don't look here. Look either before or after <laughs> and experiment your way forward. I'll take that. Yes? So it's all really interesting. And obviously the future, or sorry, the future of the law school is tied to the future of the professor, uh, to the profession. And Phil, you were asking, you know, look at where your successful alums are. So to me, this is, this is part of an issue, is that um, one of our jobs is to prepare our students to be successful, not for, just for their first job, but their first job and beyond. Yep. But if you look at, for BU, what do our students aspire to? They, as, they aspire to big law. Now, they're not all going to big law, but that's where they aspire to. And our successful alums who are in big law and have been there for t 10 or 20 years, they grew up before we talked about competencies, right? They grew up when it was all about grades. So, so how do we prepare students to, uh, you know, to succeed in the profession we think is going to exist in 10 or 20 years while still getting that first job today, inheriting a profession as it is? So um, I will frame that as our legacy problem. And I will uh, refine my earlier answer and then invite George to answer this question. Um, my earlier answer, I said successful alums, uh, I would define success broadly mm. and imaginatively. Mm. So many of our successful alums are people, like Roxanne Jensen here, who are not practicing law in a formal way. Interesting. 
And at Colorado Law, one of the blessings we have in addition to a well over the 20% uh, rule that, that Bill offers is how many alums we have who are doing things in a variety of sectors that are extremely entrepreneurial and have been successful by lots of different metrics because in general, this law school has been less wired in big law. Um, and so for me, that question leads me in a way that may be different than other law schools. Um, on big law, I'll let Bill Henderson talk to people later about the interesting findings he's had about even who's successful in big law, which is very different. Okay, so let me give one quick example that kills me. Um, a friend of mine, Bill Cavanaugh, is the managing partner of Patterson Belknap. He is the most successful litigator there by any of your metric. He went to St. John's Law School, was hired in a firm that did lots of litigation, getting paid a lot less than big law. He got hired as a contract lawyer on one case by accident, and they kept breaking their rules to move him along. And I said, Bill, why don't they try to hire more people who have the capacities that you have? They said, oh, no, you don't understand. They don't think that way. Awesome. Well, I love that. What do you want me to answer? The legacy problem. If your legacy points you in one direction and you have this sneaking suspicion that that's not the future, what do you do? I, I, I love uh, where you took it in terms of redefining what success means and looking at the edges and the variance of that. Um, and I, I would just follow that a little farther, and that is how many of us are doing today sort of like found our, found our calling based on what we thought it was? Right? Like we're assuming, you did, oh, great. We, we're assuming that the students at early age, like I, I know I want to be in big law, or I know I want to be a minister. I, I think we make this, we, we paint a picture to the students that they need to know what they should be doing with their life and that it will fall in one of these boxes. I think the, another question might be, how do we use law to help students discover their true identity and how they deploy the capacities of the way a lawyer can think and act in the world in whatever context they might find themselves in? Um, that might be another way um, to look at it, as opposed to assuming like they're going to know that answer. Because I think there's something about that. If you asked almost every single person, they would say some of the most meaningful things in their life have come from an unexpected place. It was an accident. It was an accident that I ran into David Kelly after going to a design talk and had the instinct that design could be bigger at Stanford, and now I've been at the D school for 10 years. I would have never planned that into my life. It's just literally everyone has a narrative like that. But I think we construct our education system assuming that that's not how life unfolds. Okay, Jason, last word. Right, the last, so the last conference we had in this room it was, was about on science fiction entrepreneurship. And the problem was, is how do you de define the future when you're based on everything assumption today? Yes. You and I met in year 2000. What were you doing? Uh, startup. Yeah, you were a CEO and I was a lawyer. Yeah. Did, could we have imagined what we'd be doing today? No. And Impossible. I was like, how cool is that? Right. And yeah. we were on the cutting edge of being able to see the future as a tech CEO and as a lawyer at a venture capital firm. We had no idea what was coming. So the question is, how do you design science fiction or how do you teach your students of divorcing themselves about today's yeah. realities so it, they're not handcuffed by them because yeah. yeah. even people who are in the business of the future can't figure it out can i respond with one minute or we're done you got one minute okay. i found the transformation is outside in then inside out so though you confront the student with external stimulus, like a new physical space, an external process they have to use, a hard problem they've never used before. They're around people who don't think like them. And those are external forces. What that does is it drives an internal realization that there's something else inside that they don't know how to access. Then the transformation comes inside out. They redefine their identity as an innovator. They then choose to put more of this in their life. They teach others. They change their physical environment. And they're on a new path. Um, but it's not one that they would have been able to see from the outside. So. Right. First, I want to thank George for a wonderful opening talk. It's great. Thanks for having me. And next, in a perfect segue, when we started this conversation, Scott Peppett said one of the most important and hardest things is how to manage change, particularly in this environment. So I said, fine, Scott, you can take that panel. So let's hand it over to Scott Peppett to take us through our next panel.